from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! We're on the road in Bozeman, Montana. Every member of Congress agrees with me, I think, as those I'm talking, spoken with, that this is not the time to, uh, to push for single pay. And it may come, down, may come later, but it's not going to happen in America, in my, my view. So I'm not going to waste my, waste my time pushing on something that isn't going to happen. Montana Senator Max Baucus says single-payer health care is off the table. We'll speak with Montana State Senator Christine Kaufman. She says health care is a universal human right. Then Montana is grizzly bear territory. No matter how much we interview rangers or managers or scientists, biologists, um, you know, the bear lives out there on the mountain in a complete world uh, that's barely... By our we'll speak with longtime naturalist, adventurer, and writer Doug Peacock and his wife, journalist Andrea Peacock. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're on the road in Bozeman, Montana. I'm Amy Goodman. More details have been revealed on high-level Bush administration involvement in authorizing torture. According to a timeline in the newly declassified Senate Intelligence Committee report, then National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Attorney General John Ashcroft and other top White House officials approved torture methods, including waterboarding, as early as 2000. 2002. Attorney General Eric Holders described waterboarding as illegal, while President Obama now says he won't rule out prosecuting top Bush officials who approved illegal acts. Rice's backing came in July 2002, when she gave a green light for the interrogation of suspected al-Qaeda operative Abu Zubaydah. One year later, the list of officials voicing approval grew to Vice President Dick Cheney. White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez and National Security Council legal advisor John Bellinger. The news comes as lawmakers have begun debating calls for an investigation into Bush era officials for potential prosecution. On Wednesday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi backed an investigation and said witnesses shouldn't receive immunity for testifying. Meanwhile, The Washington Post is reporting President Obama personally nixed a proposal to create a 9 11 Commission style panel as an alternative to releasing the memos. Obama made the decision following weeks of administration debate. A White House official summarized Obama's response as, quote, I banned all this. This chapter is over. What we don't need now is to become a sort of feeding frenzy where we go back and relitigate all this. The Obama administration has claimed it's closed Bush-era secret prisons, but the investigative website ProPublica is reporting more than three dozen CIA prisoners are still missing. Joanne Mariner of Human Rights Watch said, quote, the Obama administration needs to reveal the fate and whereabouts of every person who is held in CIA custody. If these men are now rotting in some Egyptian dungeon, the administration can't pretend it's closed the door on the CIA program. A federal judge has rejected a government motion to dismiss or delay a challenge to the jailing of Guantanamo prisoner Mohammed Jawad. Jawad was arrested in Afghanistan when he was 16 or 17 years old on allegations of wounding U.S. soldiers with a grenade. He's claimed he was drugged and threatened with death by Afghan interrogators unless he admitted to the charges. His case was one of five that led Guantanamo military prosecutor Darrell Vandeville to resign last year. On Wednesday, U.S. District Court Judge Ellen Huvel rejected the government's attempts to deny Jawad habeas corpus. Attorney Jonathan Hafitz of the American Civil Liberties Union said, quote, while the Justice Department chose to continue Bush administration policies that sought to evade scrutiny of Mr. Jawad's unlawful detention, today's order emphasizes the importance of independent judicial review for prisoners who've been held for years with no legal recourse. President Obama visited Iowa on Wednesday to mark International Earth Day. Speaking at a wind plant, Obama vowed to change U.S. inaction on combating global warming. If we've got problems with climate change and the temperature rising all around the world, that knows no boundaries. And the decisions of any nation will affect every nation. So next week, I will be gathering leaders of major economies from all around the world to talk about how we can work together 
to address this energy crisis and this climate crisis. Truth is, the United States has been slow to participate in this kind of a process, working with other nations, but those days are over now. Despite Obama's comments, the White House is so far refusing to endorse the nation's first-ever bill to limit emissions of greenhouse gases. As lawmakers opened hearings on Wednesday, top Obama environment officials said they're still studying the measure and have yet to make a decision. Energy industry lobbyists are vocally opposing the bill. It calls for reducing emissions to 20 percent below 2005 levels by 2020 and reducing them by 83 percent by 2050. On Wednesday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi set a new timeline for passing legislation, saying it would take more than a year. Comments came one day after vowing to pass legislation this year. As debate on the emissions bill began in Washington, the U.N. opened the year's first ministerial-level meeting in talks toward reaching a new global climate deal at Copenhagen summit later this year. The U.N.'s top climate official, Ivo de Boer, said U.S. involvement in agreeing to emissions cuts is essential. Trying to come to a long-term response on climate change without the United States makes no sense. In other words, U.S. engagement is essential. And what is very encouraging is that President Obama is committed to this issue, is committed to taking action in the United States. The International Monetary Fund is forecasting the global economy will decline this year for the first time since the Second World War. On Wednesday, the IMF said the global economy would see a 1.3 percent decline in what it called, quote, by far the deepest global recession since the Great Depression. Speaking in Washington, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner said the U.S. bears significant responsibility for the global decline. We bear in the United States a substantial responsibility, a substantial share of the responsibility for what has happened. But the factors that have made this crisis so acute and so difficult to contain lie in a broader set of global forces that built up in the years uh, before the start of the present downturn. Never before uh, has, the world, has so much of the world been simultaneously hit by a confluence of economic and financial turmoil. The chief financial officer of the troubled government-backed mortgage giant Freddie Mac has been found dead in an apparent suicide. Police say the body of 41-year-old David Kellerman was found hanging in his Virginia home. Kellerman was named Freddie Mac's acting chief financial officer in September after 16 years at the company. He came under scrutiny earlier this month after it was revealed he and other top Freddie Mac executives stood to receive some $210 million in bonuses over the next two years. In Sri Lanka, the Red Cross is warning scores of civilians have been killed or wounded in the latest military attacks on the remaining Tamil Tiger stronghold. Tens of thousands remain trapped between the crossfire. In a statement, the Red Cross said it couldn't precisely identify the number of civilian casualties, but said they're in the hundreds. In Pakistan, Taliban militants have seized control of a new area just 70 miles from the capital, Islamabad. The Buna district has a population of more than one million people. 